1864. From your textbooks, what was going on in the United States in 1864? So he was born during the Civil War. He was born when Abraham Lincoln was still president for a few more months. He passed away in 1946 after the end of World War II. 81 years. So think about how things changed during his lifetime, right? How we dressed. Enormous. The technology of war. How we fought war in the Civil War versus how we fought war in, the, in World War II. Yeah. World War One. You know, current events. Things that we read about in our textbooks that he would have read about in a newspaper. It was a period of very dramatic change that he lived firsthand. The size of the new man. Absolutely. Electricity. There's a lot of 1928 electricity in this house. Mm -hmm. Cars. Cars. Oh my gosh. Yeah, my mom grew up with buggies and horses, and she, as a result, she always hated going on overpasses mm -hmm. <laughs> in a car. She was not a good driver. Um, the Panama car now. Oh, now, he made so films much. from 1914 to 1925, 11 years. In those 11 years, he made almost 70 films. Wow. They were shorter, they made them faster. Mm -hmm. Um, he did all his own stunts, or reportedly did all his own stunts. Um, at 60? He, well, at 60, he retired at the age of 60, 61, and did all his own stunts. And there's a stunt in his last film, Tumbleweeds, where he's in a corral, and he pole vaults out of the corral. No, over it goes over. Yeah, I've seen that one, yes. At so, six, if, you know, yeah. six years, uh, and I don't think I could have done that at 40. No. <laughs> 20. So, when Hart retired from movies in 1925, he moved up here to Newhall. He would have been a com become familiar with this area because they made films out here. So, we know he made films out here. And I think this reminded him of some of his childhood <coughs> traveling around the Midwest, uh, on the frontier of Los Angeles. On the today, when he moved out here, uh, reminding him of the frontier when he was a child, which was very formative to who he became and what was important to him. Um, and he was not a real Hollywood hobnobber, so it didn't bother him to leave Hollywood. And I think that it was the frontier in 1926 that appealed to him so much. So what was it exactly where he was raised? Well, he was raised a little bit of all over the place. He was born in Newburgh, New York, which is on the Hudson River just up from West Point. I think he considered New York City his home, but he also spent some time as a child traveling around the Midwest with his father, who was a mill worker. But his father was a, a, an, um, a mechanic. So he would either be installing equipment or fixing equipment. So they were constantly on the road. And back then, there were not Hilton Express hotels every five miles, so they actually stayed with Native Americans. So that was where this passion that you're going to see throughout the house for Native American mm -hmm. culture became ingrained in him. What he saw as he spent time with that, those cultures made such positive influence on him that it stayed with him his entire life and really was formative to who he was. I think I'm going I'm to spend a couple of summer vacations up in Newburgh or Ah! Because yeah. I'm from the Bronx. And oh, okay, really, so you so, know. Yeah. Well, it's also interesting, in his autobiography, he says that when he was a kid, he wanted to be either, wanted to either go to West Point and have a military career, I'm sure that was influential from growing up in Newburgh or spending some time in Newburgh, uh, or become an actor. And his father took him aside and said, son, <laughs> you don't want to go to I West Point. I hate to tell you, but... <laughs> You don't have what it takes to go to West Point. Wow. So maybe they saw what we saw, and he encouraged, the family encouraged him to become an actor. But he said, if you're going to do that, go to Europe, get classically trained, be wow. the best. So he worked his way to Europe and trained with some of the best acting teachers of the day. And he had, you know, as most actors do, he had a little bit of an up and down career, <coughs> finally achieving some had some level of notoriety and fame and um, security. Uh, he would have been in almost any Shakespeare that was being done at the time. He played on Broadway. 
He is very well known, very uh, famous for basically creating the Gula Masala in a stage version of Ben-Hur. How do you do the chariot race on stage? <laughs> Cardboard boxes. <laughs> Today, they would have done it with puppets. You know? yeah. But back then, they actually had two wooden treadmills that were large enough each to accommodate four horses and a chariot and an actor. Oh I put the drawings. I would have loved to see wow. the person. And then the background rotated to make it look wow. like they were traveling. And then, of course, they had to make sure the masala team loses. How do they do that? They speed up the treadmill so that that team would fall back. So it's just very interesting and very uh, different. Wow. So, yes, with please, any with question. With how did he hear for the Great Depression? Um, um, yes, he would have been he living here. here. And it's something I have a lot of curiosity about. My initial guess is that he had everything in real estate. Okay. So he was not affected the way some people were. Mm -hmm. The painting there with them. How was he discovered for Hollywood for He actually <coughs> was on the road, and I want to be, I want to say he was in Cleveland, and he had a day off, and he went to see a movie. I can't believe it was the first movie he saw, but of course he saw a western. And what he saw, he writes about this in his autobiography. What he saw so disappointed him <laughs> because it was not a reflection of the West that he knew that he had lived. It was, um, he said the lead character was a cross between a Wisconsin woodsman and a Maine fisherman. Oh dear. And so he vowed then that he really needed to come out west to make movies, to show the west that was real and authentic. And that is one he's known for is creating authentic westerns. He knew the characters, he knew the scenery, he knew the wardrobe, he knew the stories, and that's what he brought. But just like today, anybody here want to work in the movie business? Come uh, on, your second career. I'm retired from You're retired, what did you do? Act. And when you first acted, yeah. how did you get in? <laughs> well, I went to school. Okay. For a lot of people, it's who you know. <clears throat> so Mark, when you didn't have it, you had an agent. Yeah. Yeah. From the very beginning. Just about. Okay. Yeah. Well, you're lucky. Yeah. Well, it was different times. I, I, was different, but I did a show and invited the agent. There you go. <laughs> I'm going to have to find more about that later. <laughs> but for most people, it's kind of who you know. <clears throat> so he had a friend, fellow actor, Thomas Ince, who they had actually been roommates. Mm -hmm. And he was already out here making movies. Culver City, Culver Studios, built a studio out there. They used to work there, so there's, you know, things come full circle. But he looked at his old friend Thomas Ince when the road show got near Los Angeles and said, please give me a chance, I really need to make Western. Ince wasn't okay with it at first, but finally he won him over, and so Thomas Ince was the one who gave him his shot. And <clears throat> if nothing, well, one characteristic of Hart is he was very loyal. He came from an era when your word was your bond. And he was very loyal to Thomas Ince, even though Thomas Ince was taking advantage of that friendship and that loyalty and not paying him what he deserved. Mm -hmm. And in fact, there was one time when he, uh, Hart had gone out of town, uh, I think it was for the World War One bond drive, and he said, um, you know, don't come back to L.A. until I tell you to. <laughs> well, Hart didn't obey that. He came back, no, he didn't tell him what to do. And he found out there was a bidding war for his uh, uh -huh. contract. Mm -hmm. So th that's kind of how he got in, was who he knew, and then it just took off, and he was a huge success. Now, he was one of the most famous silent film stars and one of the most, eventually one of the most highly paid. And I'd like to show this photograph. This is 1918 in New York City. This is an appearance that Hart made during the World War I bomb drive. There was one estimate that at one of these appearances, 250,000 people showed up. Uh, I read statistics. He made something, at one time he made 
this is like 34 cities in 30 days. Mm -hmm. In one like four hour period, he gave 20 speeches. Or by train, he had to travel by train. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And I also love a few people here would fit in this picture because we all wore hats back then. Oh gosh, yes. Yeah. yeah. So, very famous. And so men. Um, in one of, during this World War, bond, World War I bond drive, a lot of silent actors travel the country selling bonds. And we're not going to, by the way, we're not going to do the whole tour in this room. I promise. Um, but I have some things to show. Um, William S. Hart outsold Mary Pickford, Douglas Fairbanks, and Charlie Chaplin combined. Oh, oh my God. God. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. So we were talking about how. Of those people, he is probably the oh, one of the least known. I mean, 